Um, yeah, Paul, uh, I think I talk too much, I think, but anyway. Now, uh, I would like to, to take, go to you to, to you to take over and okay. maybe correct this, the things I, I said completely. Uh, yeah. Okay, so Paul. So I don't, I don't have any slides, uh, unfortunately, because I, I, I thought this was going to be more of like a QA format. Um, and I've also been working quite a bit on the new storage engine, which we're, we're hoping to make available uh, for people to, to test with um, by tomorrow. So uh, I can talk a little bit about the new storage engine. I can talk a little bit about the, I guess, first the, the format of what data looks like inside InfluxDB. So it's true that you have, you called it a, a key at first. That's what we call like a measurement name. So it could be the thing that you're measuring. Um, uh, so it could be like, for instance, your Redis server that you're measuring. And then you have a set of tags that describe metadata about it. It could be the region it's from, the host it's from. If it's sensor data, it could be the, the, you know, the building or the sensor ID or whatever. Uh, and then um, the one other thing is you, you can have multiple fields. So there's no limitation that you only have like one value for that thing. So for instance, if you're taking measurements from Redis, if you do like a show stats from Redis, there are probably, you know, a hundred different stats that you get out of Reddit, like operating stats. So you can store each one of those as a separate field um, because they all have the same metadata, which is the Reddit server that it's coming from. Um, and the other thing about Influx that's different compared to a lot of other like metrics or time series backends is uh, the you you can have different field types. So we support support float sixty fours, but we also support in 64, uh, Boolean, uh, and strings as value types. So you can store different kinds of data. And for, for things like metrics, if you, say, find an outlier in your stream and you want to store additional context, like a string, like a log line or something like that, you can inject that directly into InfluxDB. Um, so the, the storage format. <laughs> um, so as you mentioned, Whisper basically uses a separate file per metric that you're tracking, where the metric is, you know, that whole long string name that you have. Um, with InfluxDB, we, with the new storage engine, uh, we slice stuff up by a, a block of time. So, as a storage engine, it looks very similar to uh, what's called a log structured merge tree which is the kind of storage that um, LevelDB uses, which is an open source project uh, from Google. Uh, and also Cassandra uses log structured merge trees under the hood. So for the new storage engine, we took that concept and um, we modified it to make it specific for time because we wanted to be able to quickly evict entire blocks of old time. So. If you have a retention policy, say, where you're keeping data around for seven days, we wanted to make it really fast to drop old data. Um, and then, and so, Paul, does, yeah. and, and that's because you focus on how you fetch it, right? So the storage should be more focused on the, the usage, the retrieval usage, right? So that's why you also, chunk it up in different uh, time frames, and then you can get these time frames in, 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 in a bulk, and you do not have to iterate through, through it very awkwardly, right? That's right, yeah, yeah, because almost like with all the time series queries, you're always saying like, show me this measurement over time, like show me the 90th percentile or show me the counts or whatever. So we wanted to make it very efficient to look it up that way, um, but we also wanted to make it very efficient to write. Um, so one of the things the new storage engine has is, uh, we use compression schemes uh, that are specific for time series data. Uh, so for the timestamps themselves, we use a compression scheme called zigzag encoding and simple eight, which are both uh, uh, also open source stuff from, well, we didn't use any code, but uh, Google had some papers and code about those compression schemes. And then for the values for the different fields, we use a different compression scheme based on the type. So if it's float 64, 
uh, we use a compression scheme that was written about in a paper that Facebook did about a metrics database that they have internally called Gorilla, um, which is really, it's very, very efficient if you have a lot of repeated values or um, values that have small deltas, like counters that are monotonically increasing, you can end up storing that data instead of using eight bytes to store a float you can sometimes store it in as few in as little as a single bit uh, or or you know some somewhere in between uh, for booleans obviously we use bits uh, for in 64s we use something called double delta encoding uh, and then for strings we just do snappy compression which is also out of google <laughs> um, so the new, the new storage engine achieves like a much, much better level of compression uh, than anything we had before, than, certainly than the current 094 release, but also better than the 0 0.8 release um, that a lot of people are currently using. Okay. And, and this storage backend is, is optimized for one string or, or a bulk of uh, strings? So like if I want to access one metric, and I want to access the 24 hours of the metric, or can I slice all metrics by by, by a different uh, by a different slice time frame? You know, if uh, I want to have all metrics from uh, two hours ago, the five seconds or the slice, or is it more efficient in bulking the distinct metrics for a long period of time? Or can you do you switch the different storage backends for different uh, use cases, or is it? No, I mean, going forward, this storage backend is going to be the only storage backend we support. Um, the, so the most efficient query you can do is for one specific metric to query that. Um, but the, the performance for querying, like, say, say, like, you have tags in InfluxDB, so you could do a query like, show me the 95th percentile of my CPU usage for every server in this region. Right? So if you had 2,000 servers in the region, then that's 2,000 unique series that you'd be querying across at least, right? Uh, or it could be even more if you're tracking your CPU on a per core basis, right? So that query under the hood in Influx will like take all those series and merge them together on the fly and give you a result. Uh, now, currently, a lot of the inefficiency behind that query is actually not in the storage, but it's in the query engine itself. So we're working on improving that. So the, the efficiency for that query in terms of storage is really dependent on whether or not um, your data set fits in memory. So the new storage engine uses uh, memory mapped files uh, to keep the data, and they're just indexed files. Um, so if your working set fits in memory, like say you're doing a query over the last two hours and you have enough RAM to fit two hours worth of data, compressed data in RAM, then it's something that can be very fast because uh, it won't have to go to disk to get all the data. Okay. So do you, you learned from, from Elasticsearch or is it? No, so this... Uh, uh, where where do you well, get your inspiration from? I mean. Yeah, so well, so we started with InfluxDB, we used LevelDB, uh, which is, like I said, that log structure merge tree, and that, that um, storage engine is known to be like optimized for writes. It's very, very fast for writes. It's not as fast for reads, but still pretty good. Um, and then for the current 09 set of releases, we're using BoltDB, which is uh, a memory map to B plus tree. And those, those storage engines are generally known to be like optimized for reads, um, and they're not. They don't keep the data compressed, whereas LevelDB has compression built in. Now, when we switched to Bolt, we we knew we'd be taking making a trade off for write performance, but we thought we'd get more stability. It would simplify our build our tool chain to to build the project, um, and a couple of things were possible that just weren't possible with LevelDB, like hot backups of the database or moving an entire database uh, from one server to another was very, very easy uh, with LevelDB, which is a feature that we need before we can you know, finish the work on clustering. So we did that, and then over the course of the last few releases of 
the 09 line of InfluxDB, we realized that the right performance just wasn't good enough for what people need um, for a lot of the use cases we're seeing. And the compression really made a big difference, right? Like the, the new storage engine compared to the current 094 engine, the on-disk size is, I mean, it depends greatly on the shape of your data, like what the data looks like that you're going in, but it can be anywhere from, you know, a fourth as much to 25 times less in size. Like we, we basically saw, for some use cases, we saw a 98% reduction in disk space taken from the 094 release right that's out right now to what the new storage engine will give. So but if you have a fleet of servers and you collect the metrics of the system, I assume that this is very easily compressed. Like you said, if you have data series that are only slightly different, then this compresses a lot better. So this is where you, where you want to have this new backend, right? Exactly. But yeah, we, we, we were able to take advantage of the fact that time series data is very, very different than just like generalized data. So the, the compression schemes you can use with time series data give you much better performance than say just using like Snappy or LZW or GZIP. Mm -hmm. But what I meant when I said that uh, you learn from Elasticsearch is, so I'm, I used Elasticsearch for half a year or so more heavily before I just use it for log things. But um, what I learned from, from Elasticsearch is that they, yeah, they, they compute some stuff beforehand to store it um, more, uh, yeah, more optimal for search reasons. So if you have strings, they ch chunk them up, they tokenize them, they do all the magic they do, and then they store it as a, as a graph, as a, as, a, um, as a vector, so that you can search it easily. Anyway, and uh, as far as I, I, I got it, in InfluxDB, you do kind of the same thing when, you, when it comes to rollups, right? So when you, you provide a, a query that is continuously ex executed, if you, if you have to roll up every five minutes, for instance, and you have this new metric that is prefixed with five minute interval, and then you uh, introduce the roll up in this new key, right? Um, or is it well, so in one so that, that I mean, the, the, there are a couple of different concepts we use inside of FlowMXDB. So one is for all the measurement and the tag data that exists, we keep an in-memory index of it, and what that looks like is an inverted index, um, which is what Lucene is, which what which is what Elasticsearch uses under the covers. Like inverted indexes have been around for decades. That's a standard. I mean, usually you use that for indexing documents, but in this case, we're using it for indexing metrics and like measurements and tags and stuff that exist. Um, for the raw time series data, the indexing scheme we use, the data files look more like um, like SS tables do in a log structure merge tree. It's basically a read-only file that has index data and a description at the end of the file for where the different points in the file the indexes are, uh, the, the starting points for the time series are. Mm -hmm. uh, Maya, I have a question uh, uh, also regarding the, um, uh, the similarities to Elasticsearch. What we are doing at my company is uh, sentiment analy analysis. And so we have data points, uh, something like a four digit number a day, so it's not that much actually. But we have to uh, store the text there as well. And uh, we're currently using Elasticsearch uh, because of the uh, capabilities it has regarding tagging and stuff. But I was wondering if uh, that couldn't be done uh, with, uh, with, um, with the time series database, uh, but about screens, I was never sure because it's not what it's made for. Yeah, well, are you, are you there? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, some things, so with Influx, you can store raw unindexed strings. All the tag data tags are, are all strings, and we index those. The actual field values of your strings, we don't index them. So you can search them on them dynamically, and you can search on them by time. But there are things that Elasticsearch does that will never do, right? We won't provide a full text search. And they're much better in terms of um, just counting the number of occurrences of certain strings, like in, in documents that you send through. So 
it depends on the use case, right? For some metrics things and some things like, if you're converting a bunch of log data and strings and stuff into structured metrics, then Influx might be a better choice. But if you need like full text search or some of those other features, then Elastic Search is, is a better choice. And the two, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think, I know some people run both, like Elastic for one use case and, and Influx for another. Would you store an index or something to, to get the data sets together or, or is it then either that or the other because uh, we would need the text somewhere? <laughs> no, I mean, what I've seen people do is they have their own application layer um, that queries both sources and can merge the two together. But you just, in that case, you just use IDs to, to be the reference point for the, for the two different data sources. Okay, that's good to know that it's been done because it was one of them. And as I said, I, I, I use the very stupid metrics. I think that's, that's something I should change tomorrow anyways, right? That I'm not using just the simple keys, but all these tagging features that you, you have in, in Influx. Uh, right? uh, yes, yes. It's also something you want to have, right? Mm -hmm. design. What 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 keys and what values or what keys do you do you um, think that are must have or what keys are stupid? What are dead ends to use as a key in this yeah. tech uh, universe? Um. So the the big thing with us in terms of what keys make sense in tags. Because the measurement names and the entire tag index is kept in memory, there's a limit to how much you'd want to put in, right? Like anything with a super high cardinality, you know, in the millions would be something that you wouldn't want to have be a tag. Um, but if it's a server ID, which most people are running fewer than say 20,000 servers, right. then that's fine to have like a host name as a tag. And can you, can you, um tidy this up, clean this up um, easily? Can you delete a tag from all metrics, for instance? If you say, now, I, or do I have to read and write this tag, or this metrics? You can't delete a tag from metrics at this point. That might be something we could add later if people wanted to actually delete a tag. I mean, the problem is, like, under the covers, a series is represented by the measurement name and the tag set. So, um, let's say, think of an example. Um, so a series is represented by a measurement name and a tag set. Now, I don't think you would do this, but say for example, you have CPU and the two tags you have are the region and the host name. And say you have 10 servers in West and 10 servers in East. Um, if you just say like drop the host name tag, and what you're doing is you're taking 20 underlying series and you're merging them into one. So literally, like, you would have to rewrite all that data to have it make any sense. Okay. And what just pops into my head, but maybe if I, if I have but, this, oh, sorry. Well, the one thing I was going to say is in Influx, you can drop uh, a measurement completely or you can drop all series from a measurement that match a given tag. So if, for instance, you took down the the, U, the West data center and you just wanted to drop all that data, you just say drop series from CPU where uh, region equals West. And it would just drop all that data. And can I catch, so the, the use case would be I have this very same metric like the CPU usage over time for a different, for let's say two hosts and um, I have an application that is added as a tag as well. So if I have, if there's an Nginx running then I start sending the tag application Nginx. If I start an Apache then I, start, I send the additional uh, tag like application two, it's, it's equal to Apache. Can I fetch the metadata and can I, uh, Determine in which point of time the, the keys were attached to it to, to draw this line and then have an overlay where I can just have boxes where Nginx and Apache was running or not, what it, where it was part of the, of the, of the tech cloud? You can, of? yeah, because each one of those would be kept as a separate series. So you just do a query for, you know, show me the CPU where 
service equals elastic and host equals, you know, whatever the host is. Show me CPU where service equals MySQL and host equals whatever. And, then I, I, and it'll give you two it will give you two separate series and you'll get the data wherever they happen to be. Okay, all right. I get yeah, okay. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah, Okay. More questions? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Can you hear me? You do, I guess. Um, <coughs> let's say I want to store data in a resolution of uh, one minute and for, for several years, for 10 years, about 20 years. So it very likely won't fit into memory. Will this be a problem? Uh, the data doesn't have to fit into memory. It's just the, um, the tag set that needs to fit into memory. So we've tested, say, a million unique series. And it's it's fine. It's less than I mean it's in the hundreds of mega, hundreds of megabytes of RAM used for that, maybe a gigabyte or so. Um, but the data itself doesn't need to fit into memory at all. Like you you can have databases, um, you know, they're terabytes in size. Okay, and they can easily fetch. For example, I have data for twenty years, and then I, I say, okay, from the first of I don't know. Uh, 1970 to first of 1980, and then it can easily fetch the data without, I mean, quite fast, right? So big bunch of data, and I can just small time slot, and it fetches data for for this requested time. Just if you, yeah, like if you have 10 years worth of data, and you have a very specific slice of it that you want to look at, it's a very efficient lookup. If you want to look at the entire 10 year span, that's going to depend on how many data points there are and how much data you're churning through, right? Like, and that's That's basically true of any database, right? Like if your working set doesn't fit in memory, then it comes down to how fast you can get the data off disk. Uh, but we index everything by time and the unique series. So if you have 10 years worth of data and you say like, you know, give me the 50th percentile here for where, you know, host equals whatever for 1981 of uh, January to 1981 of February, that's going to be a very fast query. And, and do you have a sweet spot for, for memory? I mean, I know that Elasticsearch uh, has a sweet spot like with maximum 32 uh, gigabytes for heap size and 32 gigabytes for, uh, for the five system cache. You just <laughs> take whatever, it, whatever you can get. <coughs> you want better or is there some limit? So we haven't we haven't done enough testing yet to really to really say a good answer on that. Um, the one thing I will say is we try to not keep a massive heap of memory. Um, so because we the only caching we do inside the, the process itself is the caching of what measurements and tags exist. Assuming you have less than a couple million unique series, um, that's not going to be that big of a problem, and your data size will be you know under you know, a few gigabytes or so. Um, where memory comes into play, at least with the new storage engine, is all of the files are memory mapped, which means the data doesn't exist on the heap. It, it lets the operating system control what's in memory and what's on disk. So then, you know, we could take advantage of a server that has 100 gigabytes of memory um, because of that. And if what it won't matter, the The fact that Go is a garbage collected language won't matter because all of those memory map files, like those are completely ignored by the GC. Yeah. Okay, so it's like, yeah, so oh, yeah, sure. So all the data is in the, the file system cache. The file system cache is due to the operating system's uh, um, yeah, file system cache. So yeah. everything you do need can go to the file system cache. So the more the better. Maybe, maybe there are some uh, limitations to this, uh, but yeah, basically, cool. Okay, and I wonder in the case of backups, is there a possibility to, to back up the whole system? I mean, I can do a snapshot, but then I don't know if the snapshot, the file system snapshot is consistent. So is there something like uh, a live backup, hot backup, so that I can run a backup while the system is still running? So we're going to release that with the 0.9.5 release with the new storage engine. So you'll be able to do backups, hot backups of the database while it's running. Okay. And do you have a release date for this? Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the answer to that is when it's ready. Um, so we want, we want to get the, the new storage engine into a nightly build that people can test with as quickly as possible so that 
we like we're testing it ourselves obviously but we want other people to use it and test it as well because so far every time we've cut a release like we've had testing and it worked and then a day after we cut the release somebody uses it in some way that we weren't expecting and things break so we want to get people involved early on in the testing process so we can find bugs fix them and do all that before we actually cut the release whenever that comes so as far as testing the new storage engine, you'll be able to do that within the next couple of days. Hmm. That sounds good. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, graphite plugin. Um, at the moment, I'm using this uh, uh, drop wizard metrics library, so I have this uh, very long Java namespace uh, metric names, and I try to make sense of it by exporting text. Um, with this uh, templates and I think it's uh, quite limited because I can't match over periods. Uh, are there any plans to enhance this plugin to maybe use um, <coughs> regex uh, capturing groups or something like that? So there's, there's actually a PR open right now. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's actually a guy who lives in Germany uh, opened it um, to improve the, the graphite, the parsi parsing of graphite metric names into InfluxDB style measurements and tags. Um, here, sorry, one second. I'm actually looking for it. Uh, graphite templating uh, is an issue. It's like issue 4176. Um, uh, he said that he's going to update it, so and that will be in 095. So it will get better over time. Um, but ultimately, it, you're not going to be able to use the full functionality of Influx unless you actually move over to the Influx protocol. And my, my hope is that as you know, as Influx as a project stabilizes more and, you know, we we get closer to having, like, the 1.0 release and basically the line protocol isn't changing and that kind of stuff, then people are, will be able to have more tools that integrate with Influx that actually take advantage of, um, of all the features around having multiple fields, you know, having many, many tags, all that kind of stuff. And um, what do you think about the, of this metrics 2.0 thing? I mean, it's around for a couple of months or years even, I think. Maybe months, maybe rather than years. But, um, and it never, or it didn't take off, took off yet. I mean, you, as said, I think the, the format is quite similar between OpenTSDB and InfluxDB and most of the backends nowadays because it's common sense to have tags and a metrics uh, identifier somehow. Do you think that there is some momentum to, to maybe uh, have some, some, some common, uh, common interface? Or do you think that everyone will have its own slightly different uh, metrics format in, in the days to come? Well, I, I, so I, I know about metrics duo, and I've talked to Dieter a couple of times. Um, and I, I like the format, but um, we, we needed something that was actually useful for more than just like metrics from servers, right? Because we're, we're targeting a, a, a broader set of use cases. Metrics from servers just happens to be one. Uh, but when, when I did the design for the 09 API for the idea of measurements and tags and fields, um, I was thinking about metrics 2.0 and my goal was that we, that we could, would create a system that you could represent all of metrics 2.0 with it so and you can actually do that particularly when the new when the new storage engine ships um you can do that right because he has there's no idea of a measurement name there's just basically a set of tags a value and a timestamp. Mm -hmm. um you could do that in influx db by just having a single measurement name called metrics <laughs> use use all the tags you want and have a single field called value and, and you could represent all of Metrics 2.0 with, with the current Influx DB API. Yeah. But this would be stupid because um, you, you, you have a better search performance if you use uh, the metrics key, so this, this little name the, in front, or is it 
Is it, is it similar? Uh, I mean, the, it, having the measurement name does allow us to, to, to do searches more efficiently, maybe. Um, in practice, it probably won't be a problem for most people because they just won't have enough unique time series for it to be slow. Uh, I mean, basically, like, we still keep an inverted index in memory the same way. Um, the main thing is we wanted something that uh, made discoverability really easy uh, because when you have you know hundreds of thousands of time series, discoverability is a real problem. So we thought having a top level concept of a measurement made it easier to discover things, right? Like Telegraph, which is our data collector that we, we created, is going to have a release that coincides with the 095 release that takes advantage of the new storage engine. And every plugin that Telegraph has, so it has a plugin for Redis, a plugin for Elasticsearch, uh, a plugin for MySQL. We'll even have a plugin for gathering data from New Relic, right? You can hit the New Relic API and pull in all your data. Um, each one of those plugins will just be a measurement in the database, and then you'll have the full set of tags, and then you'll have a bunch of fields. Um, we thought that might make discoverability easier to have those different concepts. Okay. And uh, this, the, the Graphite API um, plugin, it's also from Dieter, I think, for InfluxBD. I tried to install it the other day. I think Monday or so, and I, I failed. Do you do you know if this is uh, is currently working with the InfluxDB version or Graphite MG? Is that the project you're talking about? No, Graphite API. Oh, um. this 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 uh, the, the RESTful API for or only the API part of Graphite Web. I would I'm like not to sure what the status is actually. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah, so we blog post like using Graphite NG. I don't know about the API. Ah, yeah, to be honest. Graphite Although is also I am good. gonna see I am gonna see Dieter uh, in a couple of weeks, so I can I can probably ask him about it. Yeah, but maybe I should just try out Graphite NG because it should have the same functionality, right? Anyway, yeah, I will I will I will play around with it. But just I just love the idea of Graphite API because it has all the functions that you that you have in the, in the graphite universe. And with my stupid keys, it's easy to use the stupid, or not the stupid function, but this function. And, but maybe if I, if, I more, if I move more to the tech cloud stuff, then maybe it's easier with, with, uh, with uh, Influx itself. But yeah, anyway, okay, cool. So yeah, over, over time we will get more functions. There are definitely more functions that you can do in graphite that you can't currently represent in InfluxDB. But over the course of the next, you know, six months, we'll be adding a lot of the graphite functions, and we'll be adding things like subqueries within InfluxDB, so you can basically take two queries and like merge them together into one series. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is uh, this is the beauty of this graphite API um, backend or middleware. Actually, um, more questions? Anyone? It's written in Go, by the way, in case you wonder. Question about Go. I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. So, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so um, let's say you want to store metrics for, let's say, um, site like Craigslist or something like this. You have a lot of, you want to store some metrics for each listing or whatever they have, right? So there are a lot of listings, so you have, let's say, in the millions, tens of millions, or I don't know. And maybe you don't have that many values you want to store, but still, I mean, different values. Let's say you want to store how many, whatever, I don't know, impressions and some other metrics like this. Can this system handle this? or um, And how do you suggest making the keys and the tags uh, to support this kind of? Yeah, so, so with that cardinality, it might be difficult. Uh, I mean, you can try. We haven't mm -hmm. currently, we haven't tested it with that many uh, with that many, with that high of a cardinality in the tags, like I said, we've only tested to about a million or so. Okay. Um, you can certainly try to ten million, but you you'd need a lot of memory to do it, um, just because that that index is kept in memory. You could store the listing IDs as a field, um, but then the problem is whenever you do a query, you would end up traversing 
Well, it, it, you end up doing a range scan on all of the data to match whatever the field is that you want to look up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one way to make that more efficient is to have the field be, or to have the listing ID be a field, but then have like a tag called um, uh, region, right? Like in Craigslist, they break everything out by like a different area, right? Like New York has like five different areas, right? Like Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, one for each borough. Yeah. Um, so you could literally have a tag for each, if you don't want to do each region or each like borough, you could do like one tag for New York, one tag for Berlin, one tag for San Francisco. Um, and then when you do a query, that would help you like narrow the set of data that you're, you're querying across. Oh, and maybe on this, on this um, I totally forgot to mention out because I don't use it. Um, you have the key, the tag cloud, and then you do not have only values, right? You, you have value equals a number, but you could also have different other data points, right? Maybe could you just uh, elaborate on this a little bit? Because I totally forgot it, because I, I haven't thought about it much. Maybe. Yeah, yeah so, so that was the idea of fields. So you have the measurement name, the tags, and then you have fields. So you could have value equals some number, but you could also have like, you know, long line equals some string or uh, some other context. Like I said, you can have either booleans, float 64s, in 64s, or strings. Those are the currently supported types that you can add in the fields. Um, and with the new storage engine, uh, you'll be able to have an unlimited number of fields. The current engine limits you to 255 fields per, per measurement, uh, but the new storage engine doesn't have that limitation. And the indices are connected, uh, so if you have many fields, does the search uh, uh, thing get longer? Because that would be an ideal place to, to, to put our sentences. <laughs> yeah, so the so current storage engine, all the field data is stored together, kind of like a row in a SQL database. Uh, the new storage engine uh, is designed like a columnar storage engine, which means uh, the data for a single field is kept together. So if you have one field, or if you have a thousand fields, um, a query against a single field is just as efficient, regardless of the number of fields you have. Sorry, so basically a, a query like this is more or less a sequential read, right, from the file system? Yes, for, for a single field. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then you could... Okay, then, then I could do my, my tagging about the, now it's Apache and now it's it's uh, it's it's Nginx. I can, I can put it in different fields and then I fetch this in a single metric as well. So I can just say web servers as a as a metric name, and then use different fields to identify different web servers if it makes sense to do so. But I could eventually. If I if I have a, a broad variety of, of, of different uh, of different metrics, distinct metrics that I want to store, I can just cut out the last distinct part and then make it a different field. If yeah, you know. that is one way you could do it. Like if you're tracking the CPU utilization for each of those processes, um, you could have each one be a different field. Uh, I think it might be a little cleaner to have it be tags, but. Uh, different fields would work too. And maybe if it's for each measurement, uh, the field name would change, then I would increase the amount of text with every measurement. So if I put it in fields, then it's not in the in the memory, right? Well, field names are kept in memory too, just the names. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean that's basically that's part of the the field tag measurement, all that data is like the metadata around the database and currently that metadata is kept in memory. And in, in the old storage system, as far as I, I got it, the, you basically have different fields only provide a little bit more context to the value field. And this was this the original intention to, to have like value equals something and then you can add different fields to, to have more context to this value. Uh, yeah, that was, I guess that was the original intention for that, um, but we've, after having people use it and give us feedback and, and, and different things they're doing, it became obvious that what people wanted was the ability to have 
unlimited fields and have similar things tied together. So for instance, the example I gave is like, if you do, if you're tracking your Redis stats, right, or if you're MySQL stats, like if you do the query to, to get all the stats that the server tracks, it'll give you like a hundred different readings, right? So normally you have a process that once every 10 seconds or once a minute, hits the Redis server or the MySQL server and gets all those measurements and then it sends it to your metrics back end, be it graphite or influx or whatever. Um, so what people wanted was they wanted the measurement name to be called MySQL and they wanted each field to just be whatever the measurement was that was coming from it. And they thought that was a cleaner way to organize things. Because you know that every time you get this information, you get all the other information as well so you can put it together. That's right, and the and the the, um, the metadata in the tags is always the same, right? It's always MySQL, and then most people have like some set of tags they're tracking, like the region, the host name. Um, if it's tied to a specific uh, service, the service, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, in, in in the old in the old backend, if you query one value or one field, you would get all the fields back. So you you, but in the new as I, if I understand you correctly, in the new one, you can just say, okay, I want all the, I want only this specific field of the MySQL collector, and then you only query this one field to sign. And before it was, you if you query one of those, then you will get everything back. Uh, I mean, if you query one of them, you wouldn't get everything back. Yeah, you would have to read everything off the disk. Yeah, okay. So, and it would have to decode all the values. So it's, it was much less efficient. Oh, there you are. Okay, cool. Yeah, that sounds um, yeah, interesting. Okay, okay. more comments? I just wonder if if, um, if I have some influx set up and then I update um, the newer version, will the file format change or will be automatically updated or is the file format um, fixed already so that it's uh, safe to store several gigabytes or whatever of data there without converting? So if you're running 092, 092, 093, 094, and you want to upgrade to 095 when that's available. Um, by default, so Influx organizes all of its data into what are called shards, which are blocks of time. So we'll create, say, a shard for a day. And right now, those shards are using the storage engine that the current version has. If you upgrade to 095, it'll play out the rest of that shard, and then when the next shard gets created, it will use the new storage engine. So it, it, it can run both storage engines at the same time, so all of your old data will be in the old storage engine format, which it can read and write to, uh, and the new data will be in the new storage engine format. Um, but we also want to, uh, we want to make it so that people can migrate old data over to the new format, um, but we don't want to force people to do that. We want it to be like a fast, in-place upgrade, uh, and that's what that's what you'll be able to do with 094 to 095. Um, we just think that we want to give people the ability to migrate if they want, because we think a lot of people want to do it just because of the the huge like savings that you get on disk space with the new storage engine. Okay, but there are tools as well to convert the old data to the new form. Just without interrupting the service, just in the background, some kind of migration is done, something possible? Yeah, yeah, but you would, I, like I said, by default, you're, you won't have to migrate anything, you'll be able to like, down the server and bring it back up in the new version very, very quickly, and everything will just immediately be available. Okay. And then have you used this carbon relay and G thing? Uh, I, I haven't actually used it, no. But we do, we do, I know we have a blog post up right now that went up yesterday about using it. Ah, yeah. yeah, I find it very interesting, by the way, but, yeah. Um, more questions, guys? Okay, do I have a question? I think I'm out of questions, Paul. I am. Oh! Hi. I'm currently using a lot of graphite in my company, and, and um, we're not we're not really um, we don't like the performance because it's a big setup, and it's 
special wheat farm. And for that reason, we looked into your engine. Yeah? We like the performance. What was missing, of course, is the functions, as all its functions that uh, Graphite provides, but more um, the function chaining. I can do easily some series in Graphite and then uh, filter over them and then aggregate stuff and whatnot, right? Is, is, is that what you mentioned before, these uh, sub-queries, is that going into that direction? And do we want to support these, uh, I don't know, 10 levels of, um, of chaining then? Yeah, that's, so that's exactly what sub-queries are going to be for, so that you can chain different queries together to do transformations over the different series. Oh. Okay. I would love to uh, uh, the ST uh, core library from the New York Times has just been updated. They're trying to make a flow-based language. It has also a, a visual programming part, but you can just ignore it and use it, and it's rock solid. I don't know how good it performed because it didn't really um, But um, the other thing is Mozilla Hika. It's uh, doing basically the same. The Mozilla Hika thing is programmed in Jura and the uh, ST core thing in JavaScript. And, uh, yeah, but Hika is Go. You can uh, use ST core. Also, is also Go. It's both those. Yeah. The reason why I evaluated, uh, evaluated those uh, ones that I plan to uh, read soon. Another question. Um, Graphite, what I. Um, it has a lot of functions. But it has a fixed set of functions, right? And if someone would like another function, he would have to to manipulate the, the code of, of graphite itself, right? Uh, wouldn't it be, be possible to, let's say, create an interface so that um, functions are something like that can be plugged in by people so that they can create their own mm -hmm. functions? Yeah, that's uh, that's something that has been on our to-do list for over a year. Ah, cool. <laughs> we. We want to do that. Um, the problem is we just have too much, too many other things have to get done first before we can get to that. Uh, but it is something we would like to do eventually. Yeah, cool. And and on that note, do you do you architect your uh, interest to be in a way that that you would just use? I mean, in uh, in Hika, for instance, you have this Lua function that you can, or this Lua script that you can include, and then you you can easily create your own function. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you could do something similar that the functions are plugins that you internally use anyways, and then if someone else wants to create his own function, like um, like uh, the previous speaker, that, that you, you just put it there and then you can use it? Is this a way, or do you think that it will be distinct internal functions and external functions, or will it be the same? I think they're going to have to be distinct just because there's a performance penalty if you're going to use Lua, right? You have to go over the C bridge, the Go C bridge, um, whereas all the, all the existing built-in functions are written in Go. Now we have, we already have like a framework for that. Um, so we're doing some refactoring of the query engine right now, but sometime soon we'll actually put up a write-up for anybody who wants to create their own functions. Uh, but unfortunately, Go doesn't allow you to dynamically link code in uh, to a running process. Uh, so basically, like if you want to build your own functions, you're going to have to recompile the project uh, or submit a PR, and we'll bring it in and bring it in and put it in a future release. Um, but then, if we're going to do custom functions, really the the only way to do that would be through like a scripting language that we can embed in the, pro the process itself. But we wouldn't want to create all of the built-in query functions via that scripting language because of the performance hit that we take. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, cool. Someone else? I mean, we, we, we took one and a half hours of your time. Maybe we could, uh, we, should, we should limit it a little bit. So maybe if there are pressing questions, then we, we address it. Otherwise, I think then we and you cannot copy Yeah, so all thanks a, oh wait, uh, yeah. thanks a lot for yeah. attending.